Hello, and I'm thrilled that you are here. And if you want or need a certificate for continuing education, I'm happy to provide that as documentation to meet your needs for um, continuing ed. Um, we're thrilled to welcome today Molly and Amanda. And in January, we're welcoming Carrie Pace from Ferguson Florissant. And we've also got a few more folks on the horizon. And we are still seeking um, data-driven design arts integration action research teams. I, so I can see. And in the meantime, I will tell you, I was so lucky to be able to attend the event that uh, COCA on no November the 7th and the 8th. And it was really wonderful. I just enjoyed it so, so much. So um, it, I saw Kara come by. Kara, is there anything you wanna share about what's going on with the Kansas-Missouri Partnership in arts education, or excuse me, arts integration? I can drop the link to our website in the chat here in a minute, but we're pretty quiet until after the first of the year and the, the end of January, beginning of February, we've got um, a digital event with Jamin Carter. Um, he is a Kennedy Center trained artist. He does mostly work with visual arts and his program is called Drawing Symbols. Um, I don't have the whole thing written down in front of me, but I'll drop the, the um, link in the chat so you guys can check that out. And that's free and it's all digital. There's two different times that you can take it and uh, there's an asynchronous piece that you watch beforehand and then it all gets tied up together when you um, join the Zoom with the other attendees. And that's what we've got going on. Well, thank you, Kara. And I don't see anybody from the other two um, right now, but if they do hop on later, or of course I will try to keep you guys all updated if they have information that they would like you to receive. So thank you for being here today. And uh, we're getting ready to go into our breakout sessions. And right now I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda. So my prompt is a little bit of an arts integration um, reflective moment, um, taking English language arts and social emotional learning and visual art to think about um, the prompt that I've just given you in the chat. So when you're in your breakout rooms, you might spend a little time looking at a detail of this work of art together and thinking about that, okay? And sharing what, you, what you're seeing, what you're thinking, connections you're making. And I'll, if it's okay, I'll open the rooms. So we'll see you guys back here in about seven to 10 minutes. So Amanda, will you restate the question, please? So, so um, in Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, he wrote, many are strong in the broken places. And so what I'm posing is looking at this work of art um, and thinking about how um, that quote, that prompt might um, connect to this work of art as well as maybe connecting to things in our lives right now. So like the thing I might, you might wonder is, um, so, you know, like what's going on with this work of art? What, you know, think about what it is that we're seeing. What has the artist done? Well, the, I forget the name of this technique, but it's um, when something breaks and you put it back together and instead of trying to hide the flaws, you use the flaws to emphasize the beauty. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me think of um, just, uh, that some, when we go through something hard and um, something really challenging or that makes you feel broken, that you, um, the way that you put yourself back together is beautiful and shouldn't be hidden, but should be emphasized. It's called Kintsugi and it's a Japanese tradition. K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, -I, I believe. It's weird. I actually looked this up, that I'm word up like a month, that. like a month ago, I looked it up because some, I was talking with someone about the type of art in reference to comparing it to people. So when this came up, I was like, whoa, I feel like I'm having deja vu. <laughs> My comments would be that um, 
in my own life right now, I'm uh, constantly living in uh, what is a definition of arts integration. And so for this to be a prompt, and especially from the quote that you gave, I immediately went to, is this an example of using something from an art world to enhance a lesson or what will I need to do? What, is, what are the two learning objectives, something from ELA and something from <laughs> art that are both important to teach and I want a deeper understanding on to be able to accomplish the mission of both of those if I want it to enter into arts integration. So my head was starting to, to look at um, um, in art, I may do this either in a, 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 either a ceramics class or I may do it in a, a, a general like art one or two or three or four class that mm -hmm. I'd, I would want to look work with things that are broken and I would want to look on structurally, how are we going to be able to adhere them or get them to a symbol or uh, what will we do with edges? What will we do with color? I think there's many things, but it's, it's hard without my knowing. It's hard for me to tie it to arts integration without knowing what were the art standards that I was trying to use and advance at the same time I was trying to advance the ELA ones as well. Well, there's social emotional learning here too. So, and that's kind of like transcends disciplines. Um, and, and you're thinking very much, and I, it processes that really, I think process is something that's really critical to this piece and interesting about this piece, but there's also issues of aesthetics. Um, and actually there's an article I'd be happy to share with you by Donald Keene. It's called the Japanese idea of beauty. And what he's doing is he's talking about how, you know, it, it, the, we tend to sort of assume that our perceptions of beauty are shared by everyone and that just simply isn't true. And so what he does is he's talking about things that are valued in Japanese society versus um, things and not trying to overgeneralize, but just to sort of basically give this idea that aesthetics are something that vary across cultures and time and places. Um, and so what Kara was referring to of showing the beauty of wear and tear is something that's valued in Japanese society versus where if I were to break something, I would be doing everything I possibly could to hide the fact that I'd broken it so that it looked perfect. Um, and I'll have to get that citation. I can share that if, if the very least I could get it to Phyllis and she could share it with everyone. Are there associations um, in Japanese culture to the colors that are used in this object? You know, I don't actually know the question to that. I mean, the answer to that question. And then you, you're catching me on something there because Kara brought up Kara brought up kintsugi, and then I said kintsugi is a Japanese tradition. But the tricky bit here is that what we're actually looking at is a Korean work of art. Okay, so we're actually looking at a Korean ceramics tradition. And actually this artist is not referring to Kintsugi. Instead, she's um, uh, making a play on words because in Korean, uh, break and gold are the same word. So she's covering the breaks with gold. Although I think that the, that the way of thinking about this in terms of the Japanese tradition of Kintsugi is completely relevant in terms of all the kinds of ways that we might understand this work of art, but it's actually Korean. So the pottery is Korean. And I don't know about color symbolism. That's a really interesting question and it would be fun to find out. Is there someone who would like to speak who's not yet had a chance to? Julie, you're muted. There she is. Hi, Julie. We can see your beautiful face, but we cannot hear your voice. I can't. Can anybody else? Maybe she can type it in the chat. Yeah, Julie, can you type your, your, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Well, I'm getting ready to close all the rooms, give everybody a few more seconds to come on back. Well, thank you to everyone for participating in that experience. We do still have the image here on the screen and I did send it in the chat. Um, is there anything from uh, the, the YL1 group that had Jenny, Jenny, Jessica, Bob, Sandy, Tom, or is it Ashriel? I may not be saying that name right. Ashriel. Ashriel. Since you, you're unmuted, Ashriel, can you tell us something or share a little bit from your group, please? Uh, 
No, you don't have to. <laughs> yes, she does. No, that's why I dance. I'm not a huge talker. <laughs> well, you could you could show you could show us through dance if you wanted. We're easy. Is there anyone who would like to share from that breakout room experience? Well, we, we were uh, made up of a bunch of talkers. So yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that nobody chimed in. <laughs> but I don't want to steal that thunder. Go ahead, had, Tom. Let it had, go. Well, we had several ideas. And, um, and Ginny related um, what the, the concept behind the... Uh, the broken sculpture to some of the work she did. Um, I, I, the only thing I remember with great clarity, of course, is what I said. And I said that it reminded me of um, the fact that, you know, that, that things are stronger where they were once broken. And, and that's a direct quote from Bob, um, is, is how learning takes place under construct, constructive, a constructive approach and that cognitive dissonance, dissonance and to, or taking things apart and creating a sense of discomfort um, briefly, just the right amount of discomfort, and then putting them back together helps to create stronger learning bonds. I want to add um, that Jenny did a great job also of talking about um, how arts integration allows for voice and choice and how important that is. And I think it's Ashriel who was saying, you know, she prefers not to speak much, but she does things through dance. And so that is a powerful example of exactly what we're talking about. Um, and then for me, I saw the broken pieces as um, what's referred to as wabi-sabi and how when there are cracks, that's when the light comes through. And um, who was it? Uh, then Jenny. Jenny was talking about how um, she has taught with um, her students and that she said that she is a collector of um, oh, the what shards. Was the, the shards. Shard. Yeah. She's a collector yeah. of shards. And the, I, go ahead, Jenny, you tell. I'm the, and I'm the keeper of the shards. And so I asked them what they were keepers of. Because people send me their broken things, and I use them to recreate and put back. And they'll, and they'll write their notes. They write notes to me. This was my grandmother's. You know, I've had this for 30 years. In the bro you know, they write me these notes, and they send me these, bro these things that are broken. And I put them together into pieces of art. And... So I'm the keeper of the shards, and um, when those shards include lots of stories and lots of history, and so I asked the kids, the fifth graders, what they were keepers of, and we were working on a stained glass window, and one of the girls said she was the keeper of light because she was doing the pieces on the, on the moon phases, and she was choosing light that let the light shine through, and then we just started talking about what what we were keepers of. And so now it's become a thing. Whenever I have fifth graders, I talk to them about what they're keepers of. And during this COVID times, they talked about they were the keepers of love or they were the keepers of family stories or it was interesting. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Jenny. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't heard from the secondary group that had uh, Amy, Christy, Maggie and Melinda. Is there someone in that group who wants to share a little bit about your reflection together today? Please, anyone? You don't have to. Well, I'll hop in. I, I was, uh, I'm Melinda with Kansas City Repertory Theater and uh, um, Maggie, Christy, and Amy uh, all work in visual arts. We were uh, little kind of bad kids. We weren't entirely clear on our assignment, but we um, had a great talk about the, we didn't get to the art piece, which is gorgeous, um, but we did talk about um, kind of the urgency of social and emotional learning via what we do. And Christy was uh, revelatory in, in, for me, and I think for each of us talking about social justice standards, which I did not know existed. Um, um, just some coping strategies that we can integrate into our arts work. Um, since I don't work in a school, sometimes I miss uh, some of these, but it was really inspiring. 
um, what what she was talking about. She seems to be a leader in her school and district in St. Louis. Um, and uh, we just talked about the importance that clearly social and emotional learning that the arts can help with so much is going to be top priority for longer than we originally envisioned and uh, not just the end of the school year, but way beyond. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. I would be interested in knowing more about the social justice standards. Yeah, me too. Well, ask Christy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Christy, if you have any resources, would you please put them in the chat? And and we we will talk about that at some point. But I do want to um, oh, thank you so much. Um, any other last bits of sharing about our small group interaction time before we move on to our presentation today? Well, thank you everyone for participating in the small group activities. Um, every time I hear about the conversations, I get inspired in, by, in, in ways that I had no anticipation for um, when I posed a question or when we start, when we all fired up our computers today. So thank you for that always, thank you. So now it is time for our presentation from Amanda Martin Heyman. She is involved with the Kansas University Spencer Museum of Art and they have a long standing um, relationship with teachers in their community who have been exploring arts integration as it relates to um, resources at the museum. So Amanda, Please take it away. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen again. And hopefully pull up what I need. Oh, I keep closing it. Okay, let's try that again. So um, my, I do know a few of you. So hi, everybody that I know and hi, everybody that I'm getting to know today. Uh, because I have not done anything with um, the Missouri Alliance before, I thought that maybe a good place to begin would be just to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the things that we have available. And I wanted to focus on things on our website uh, because those are the things that I think everybody has the easiest access to right now. But really, it's more just about kind of a buffet of things that we've been um, creating, doing as a starting off point for identifying other things that you might want to dive deeper into or know more about. So, uh, you know, possibilities for uh, modeling a lesson or activity or um, going deep, more deeply into a particular topic. But today it's just a buffet of things that we have on our website, letting you know those things are available and how to use them. And knowing that I'm someone that would really love to have more conversations with you and get to know you and um, um, kind of share ideas and strategies around arts integration. Amanda. So, yeah, I wanted to alert you. Sometimes if you share the screen when you're reading something, it shares the last screen you were on. So right now, something? we're not seeing the website. Is that your... Oh, it's... Okay. Yeah, we are seeing a Word document of information. And that's not going away. Okay, let's try this. Let's try. So, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, but if you select share screen and then before you... Make sure you've got the right window open that you want. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just copying all those wonderful links from the chat. Um, let's try this again. There we go. That's going to work because it's actually the right screen that I'm seeing. Now are we good? It says Spencer Art at Home. Yay! Yay. Okay, wonderful. So this is our homepage, all right? And the thing that I'm going to really be focusing on today is the Spencer Art at Home because we've really... As, as a lot of organizations 
um, are doing. We're really um, trying to create a really an easy way for people to access our digital content and trying to make available as much digital content as possible. So we've had a lot of things, they just haven't been publicly available. And uh, I think that it was something that would eventually have happened, although I think COVID certainly has caused us to maybe um, get our act together a little more quickly. So this is Spencer Art at Home. And the things that I'm gonna have us looking at begin with create. And I wanted to share create with you because there are three just little um, art activities. Uh, I'll open one up and they're just very simple. Uh, it's a PDF that you can even print that use works of art to just do something very quick and very easy, okay? The other thing I want you to notice is that when I open something on our website, it opens a new tab. So whenever you go into something, you're not gonna lose where you were on the website. And I think that's a feature that's important to be aware of because you don't have to worry about having to say start over with your search. Um, and then the next area I'm going to show you that we'll spend a little more time with is the learn section. And I'm gonna begin with our K-12 lessons database. And actually the little activity that we did during reflection um, came from a lesson that's in this database, okay? So we were really fortunate to receive funding from the Freeman Foundation uh, to work with teachers in the Salina area for two years. Um, and the focus of that uh, collaboration was working with Asian art and culture. And we did this from, we, social emotional learning was a, a, a important part, a point of departure in this work, okay? Um, on top of that, one of the things that all of the teachers did was create object-based lesson plans. And these teachers were coming from many different disciplines. So you get some wonderful arts integration opportunities happening through these lesson plans. Um, the teachers worked with us to determine what the design for the lesson plan template would look, look like and what kinds of things would be important for doing searches. So you can see we have keywords and if you go to that, there are, there are already pre-loaded keywords that you can choose from. This is a database that's going to continue to grow um, as we collaborate with more teachers. It's very much teacher driven. Um, you can go to subject and search English language arts, library, science, social studies, SECD, visual arts, and reset. So why don't we just pick one? It's not wanting to, it's not wanting to let me go back. So I'm just gonna pick one right there. Social, emotional, and character development. And I'm going to go search. And that's actually going to take us to the lesson plan that I used today, okay? So this is not the one I used, but it's another one that does so, makes social, emotional learning connections. The one I used today was strong at the broken places Kintsugi, the Japanese art of mending broken bowls. And so when you click on the lesson plan title, it takes you to an image of the work of art, a little bit of information about it, and then um, lesson plans that are associated with that work of art. I'm gonna click on the original one. And then here's the lesson plan. Here You'll see it in its digital form on the webpage, but you can also click on this PDF and you'll get a PDF um, that you can print out. So it's just an easier format to work with. But then you'll see here where you've got Ernest Hemingway's quote, um, the standards connections that it's making, um, the objectives, the materials, the steps required to complete the lesson plan, any resources that you might want to access um, related to the object and also related to the lesson. Okay. So kintsugi is a Japanese tradition of breaking things using gold to actually highlight the break versus hiding it. 
and this relates to Japanese value systems and ideas of beauty that um, values uh, uh, perseverance um, uh, and perishability. So um, something that has wear and tear it is a sign of it being used and a sign of it being loved and having important status within someone's life. So rather than considering it ruined, it has just has another layer that has been added to it through that break. Okay. So then you can also search by grade level or like I said, standard code. Okay. So I'm going to click on this one. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that. Let's do this. Natsuki things we want and need. So another feature is that we got a 3D printer and we had a number of objects in the collection um, 3D imaged. So many of the works that are a part of this have the opportunity to look at them from a 3D standpoint. So I can click on that. And now I can actually maneuver that on the screen and see the object from all sides. And I imagine when you're doing this your own screen, there we go, it would maybe work better. We need to see it better, but there you go. Okay, so just another um, thing that can be done with this uh, particular lessons database. So then when we go back to learn on the uh, Spencer Art at Home, we also have a curricular resource database. And this database has been loaded with assignments that um, KU faculty and graduate teaching assistants have used. Although I think that many of them are very versatile in terms of um, using in K through 12 classrooms. The big difference being that we don't, we don't have the standards um, connections highlighted. But I could like go over here and, and there, uh, this has a wider range, I think, of keywords and, and those sorts of things. I'm going to put in civil rights and see what comes up. So we have right now an assignment where you're using rhetorical analysis and you're applying that to visual art. Uh, and I, this is actually, um, and then some examples of works of art that might be included in that lesson. And then something else to understand is that if I am, click on Threadman for this work of art right here, it will take me to that work of art in our collection search. And then if I scroll down, there's any label text that's ever been created about the work of art. There may be digital resources that might include audio, video, other imagery of the work of art, any exhibition the work of art has been in. There you see when I click on that, then we get what label text has been created for that work of art. Uh, I wanted to point out this one because rhetorical analysis some, is something that I've done a lot of work with in regards to visual art. And that's something that if any of you are interested in making English language art, uh, arts integration connections, using that topic or even the topic of narrative devices. Those are two things that I have a lot of interest in, I've done a lot of work with and would be interested in doing for all of you if that tripped your trigger. Um, so there's this resource as well. Uh, another thing that you should be aware of, and I'm actually gonna go back to the art at home. Um, this right here under Learn Resources Remote Teaching is a video that goes through very carefully how to use the curricular um, online research, resource search, okay? So if you're wanting more detail about that, I highly recommend this, this video right here, okay? And then under Watch, there are three things that I think might be of interest to you. To you. One is that we have a series of videos that were made as a part of the Freeman Foundation project in Salina 
that um, demonstrates calligraphy, that looks at the tr tradition of the Daruma and Daruma dolls um, in Asian culture, uh, tea culture in Asia, landscape painting, and then also looking at historical and contemporary Korean blue and white. So I, um, I highly recommend perusing those videos uh, to see if any of those might be useful for your classes or even segments might be useful for your classes. We also, and this is something that's come from COVID, have made our artist talks that were videotaped available online. So if you're familiar with James Terrell and his light sculpture, we have a conversation with James Terrell. Um, we have, if any of you are familiar with Faith Ringel, she's an African-American artist who works with narrative quilts. We have an interview with her and many other artists. So I really highly recommend um, looking through this uh, sort of index of artist talks that might be interesting to um, include in your curriculum. And then for a more behind the scenes look at the museum, we have a number of videos that are looking at artists in residence and their work in the museum and actually watching them to um, installing their work and talking about their work. So it's very much this sort very much this sort of um, a perspective that you don't often see in museums. You see the finished installation, you see the finished works of art, but through these videos, you get a, a kind of a more in-depth um, look at their process and practice and the kinds of um, sort of philosophical foundations or things in this world that have informed the work that they do. Okay, then under listen, we have um, something that I'm really very proud of. We've had an ongoing partnership with uh, a gifted teacher at Southwest Middle School in Lawrence. And every year, her students create uh, basically an audio tour uh, about works of art they've researched in the museum. Uh, they create about a minute and a half, two minute segment where they share some of the research they've done and talk about the work of art from their perspective. So it's this great opportunity to get this eighth, eighth grade point of view on works of art in the collection. And I think it also highlights the kinds of opportunities that are available um, for teachers to do collaborative works with museums, whether it's the Spencer Museum of Art or some other uh, resource in your community. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that um, students can engage with those places in very authentic ways. So this isn't just a practice assignment these students did, they've actually created content that our visitors um, um, connect to uh, either on our website or when they come to the museum and are looking at works of art that are on view. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna move away from art at home and I'm go going to show you two more things that I think you might find handy. Uh, how am I doing for time? I was going to set my alarm and then I didn't do it. Have I have I hit my 15 minutes, um, Phyllis? We probably have another four minutes before. Okay, great. We good, good, good. Open good. up our Q&A and, and close yeah. up. Yeah, okay. So this will only take me a moment, but I want you to be aware of this. So the Spencer Museum of Art has a fully comprehensive collection, which means we have art all the way from ancient art to contemporary art. And we also have a fully global collection. We have probably nearing 50,000 works of art in our collection. We actually have more art in our collection than the Nelson Atkins does, okay? I'm not saying it's anywhere near the Nelson the Atkins in terms of sort of hierarchical canonical terms, but we have a really diverse and large and broad collection of art. And most all of that art is searchable through an online database. Uh, you're able to get pictures of the works of art. You're able to get um, any label text that's ever been created for that work of art. You're able to get any um, digital media that's attached to that work of art. Um, you can find out any exhibition it's been in. And so it's just a really wonderful resource for um, connecting with the museum uh, when you're not actually able to physically be here or to do some sort of a research project. So I'm gonna pop in a work of art here. I'm gonna put in a Missouri work of art. We're gonna do a little Thomas Hart Benton. And actually you can see here, 
that we have many of the study drawings that go with this work of art. So not only can you look at the painting, but you can see the process um, Thomas Hart Benton used um, in creating this work of art. And many of you may also know that he created um, full clay dioramas for his paintings. So they were completely three-dimensional when he actually went to painting the work of art. And he didn't really keep these dioramas, but Eldon Teft, who is a fairly known Kansas sculptor, talked um, Benton into allowing him to cast a couple of these maquettes. And we actually have one of those on view in the museum. So we even have a sculpture of Benton's practice of creating these three-dimensional maquettes. So here is the ballast, Ballad of the Jealous Lover of Lone Green Valley. Um, when you open this up, you get the basic information about the work of art here. I can click on the picture uh, to maybe to, to focus in on that. Uh, and, it's just gonna, and then I can scroll down and again, you see all these different options. Um, all the label text, which includes the lyrics, this is that is associated with the ballad that uh, this painting is about. Um, when you go to digital resources, um, there's actually uh, musicians, the Stanley Brothers, playing the ballad of the Jealous Lover of Lynn Green Valley. So you can look at the painting and you actually listen to the ballad. We have a PBS segment on Thomas Hart Benton that you can watch as well as a number of different um, kinds of audio content that has been created that goes with this um, particular work of art. And in many cases, we also have audio description. We've started an audio description um, uh, program at the museum for people that, are visual, that have visual impairments, but also thinking about English language learners. Uh, so that is the collection search. Now, if I go back, I can also search by artist and maker and I can search by exhibition. And the thing that's important about exhibition is that even if you aren't able to view an exhibition that has happened at the Spencer Museum of Art, you can always still view it virtually, which is really exciting because I have worked with teachers on a number of different exhibitions that they continue to use in their curriculum because they can continue to use it online, even though it's not available physically in the museum anymore. So for instance, I have a teacher that uses an exhibition that was called American Dream that students actually curated for the Spencer Museum of Art that selected works of art that really question and critique this idea of the American Dream and whose American Dream is this. Uh, you get pictures of the installation, but if you click on works of art, you get every single work of art that's in this exhibition as well as the ability to do the collection search so that you get all of the content to go with it as well. Um, this is important for the exhibition stage in Shimamura that's on view right now, and also important for Healing, Knowing, Seeing, which is the exhibition that will be opening this spring that I was supposed to spend some time on. And here I am uh, being too verbose and using up all my time. Um, but you can, go to, you can go to current exhibitions, virtual exhibitions, past exhibitions, and future exhibitions, which takes us to Healing, Knowing, Seeing, which is looking at, how, it's a cross-cultural perspective on illness, aging, and death. And it's also looking at how the role that art plays in expanding knowledge about the body and about illness and about healing. So that's the knowing part. And then also how the act of observing and visualizing the body can generate new forms of understanding. And this is a really timely exhibition in the context of the COVID pandemic and all the sorts of uh, health issues that that has brought up. This image right here is a work that was done by an artist who suffers from cystic fibrosis and the work of art is his way of expressing that experience. Um, having had two double lung transplants in his lifetime. And right here, that's what we're seeing are his medical team around him doing a transplant. They have halos relating to his religious beliefs and the spirituality associated with his experiences. And then here are the winding bronchial tubes of his lungs. 
So this is just a little taste of that exhibition that will be opening in February and will be, be available in the museum as well as fully online. So that is as much as I was gonna to share today, that is my buffet of digital resources. I'm going to stop sharing and then open this up for questions. And the very last thing being that this was my way of saying, I would love to chat with you. I would love to talk with you. Arts integration is something that I do a lot of work with, um, especially related to museum collections. And uh, so look me up and I put my email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing all of that. Um, I know that several people will have to zoom out in the next, <laughs> zoom out in the next two minutes or so um, because we're coming to the end of our time. But if there are any questions at all, please place them in the chat. And even if we- or email me. <laughs> email Amanda. Um, even if we can't get to them today, um, just I'm so thrilled to know that there are are such wonderful resources available, particularly for people who may have challenges traveling to mm -hmm. your location. There's still so much that they can utilize wherever they are, provided they have internet access. So um, thank you so much for, for bringing that to light. Are there any specific questions? That <clears throat> Check in the chat right now. Lots of people are saying thank you. That's nice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Yes, we're hopefully it will inspire some of our our friends. I, I tell you, I was struck by um, I've been attending some Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, science uh, works, and they have been using museum resources, visual arts, to practice observational skills mm -hmm. as a tool to help them do observational skills when they are working in a in a science rich content. And many of the science professionals are just saying, my kids are doing so much better now because they are utilizing writing strategies and interactions with visual art, which is in turn helping them become um, more keen observationalists in their science work. So. It's, it's sort of the gorilla guy in the gorilla suit going across the basketball court, you know, teaching you to look differently and to look carefully and to understand how our looking is so kind of, you think you're seeing everything, but you're not. And, and, and visual art has proven to be a really, a really exciting way to, to hone those skills of observation. There's a respiratory therapist faculty member um, from KU Med that's been working with the Nelson Atkins on a project related to that. It's fascinating mm -hmm. and, and makes me even more aware of how important arts integration is. Well, I wanna say thank you again to Amanda for today um, and for sharing with us. I wanna say thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, please give Molly our best. We're sorry that she wasn't able to be with us. And I'll just give you a little sneak preview of what's coming up in future main events. Carrie Pace was on the call. I don't know if she still is, but she teaches in Ferguson Florissant at a STEAM school. She's gonna be our presenter in January. And then we have Stephanie Hasty and Elizabeth Barker who will be with us in February and again in April. And Jenny, who is on the call today, yay! The keeper of the shards uh, will be with I us. I love that story. I do too, I do too. Um, well, I wanna say thank you to everyone. Please, again, if you need that, um, continuing ed certificate, please put it in the chat. If you have any other questions, please put those in the chat or connect directly with Amanda to get your questions answered. And you've got my email address, most of you do, but just in case, I'll throw it up there on the screen and put it in the chat as well, director at moaae.org. Thank you and help us continue to find the best ways to serve you um, and have a great rest of your Monday. <laughs> <laughs>